Absolute nothingness transcends all that is, but at the same time, all that is arises through it. So says Kitaro Nishida in An Inquiry into the Good, which is uh, the book that I'll be discussing today. And now, uh, Kitaro Nishida is the founding philosopher of the Kyoto School of Philosophy, which is a 20th century Japanese school of philosophy. And I was actually turned on to this uh, by a guy called The Immoderate on Twitter after I posted my review of the nihilism book by Father Seraphim Rose. So ended up ordering a, a couple of books. One of them is Religion and Nothingness by uh, Keiji Nishitani. But The Inquiry into the Good is the book I read this week, Katara Nishida. And this is the founding text of, of the Kyoto School of Philosophy. And why this is significant is this is really the first... Um, this is the first sort of systematic uh, presentation of uh, an original Japanese philosophy um, that's presented uh, within the ongoing discourse and discussion of, of Western philosophy. Uh, because Jap Japanese philosophy really only encountered Western philosophy in the late 19th century, around the 1880s. And the first kind of philosophies they would have encountered would have been like British utilitarianism, French rationalism, and at the time, they would have seen these as much less, uh, much less sophisticated than the popular East Asian schools of thought, and rightly so. But at the same time, they were impressed by how uh, logical and objective uh, the Western approach to philosophy was. So there was clearly something to be got out of a, an encounter between the two. But it was really with German idealism. Uh, that there was the potential for something really systematic and original to come out of that because German idealism is very much uh, much closer to Eastern modes of thought in that um, it's you know it's sort of pantheistic uh, it has kind of a mystical element it you know presents uh, consciousness as in some sense uh, unitary with the absolute you see this in thinkers like Fichte, Schelling, uh, Hegel um, you know, someone like Schopenhauer was uh, very much saw his thinking as being in line with Buddhism. Supposedly, he used to keep a copy of the Upanishads under his his pillow. He used to read them every night. Um, and Nishida himself is is very uh, impressed by Schopenhauer, draws on him a lot. Uh, but the Kyoto School very much draws off German idealism, especially Hegel. Uh, they also interact with the thought of uh, Heidegger. Um, but that quote, you know, in the mention of nothingness, that's really where the original contribution of the Kyoto School comes in. And this is where you see the influence of the, the Zen background of these people is, you know, nothingness is something that's very much overlooked in Western philosophy. But for the Kyoto School and for Eastern modes of thought, it takes on absolute significance. You know, in Taoism, the Tao is basically equated with nothingness. And there's passages in the Tao Te Ching about being, arising from non-being, um, same thing in, in Indian modes of thought, you know, uh, Brahman, the absolute, uh, qualityless, that the only way to realize the absolute is, is neti neti, this process of uh, negation where, uh, you know, you realize that the, the absolute is not this, not this, not that, not that, that it's, it's these pointers towards negation. Uh, and we did see this somewhat in, in, in Western philosophy with someone like uh, Pseudo Dionysius, who uh, Thomas Aquinas drew on a lot, apophatic theology um but being and the study of being has always been central there hasn't been as much this conception that being arises within and through non-being or is in, in some sense a reflection of non-being that our conception of nothingness is something that's very uh, very static whereas the eastern conception of nothingness is is something that's uh, sort of creative um that you know the the ten thousand things come from the the one suchness that comes out of absolute nothingness that there's this kind of creative power uh in nothingness that it's it's absolute potentiality so this is something that the kyoto school would draw on a lot would use a lot um to uh tackle western you know questions of western philosophy with this is their the great contribution and this is where you see again and again with nishida he's drawing on eastern wisdom on 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 um on Buddhist lines of thinking, 
He's not canonically uh, citing Buddhist texts to back up his arguments. He's very much arguing in the context of Western philosophy. He's arguing about problems of Western philosophy. He's arguing about the you know, subject-object distinction and the many and the one and the nature of God and all of these things. And he very much more draws on, on Christian thinkers. He'll quote people like Pascal. Um, he'll quote uh, German philosophers, as I say. He's very much up in the philosophy of his day and he's entering into... Uh, you know, modern Western discourse. But where you see the Buddhist influence, where you see the Zen influence, is that he he introduces these concepts that would be novel to a Western audience, like nothingness as the basis of reality, um, like the self uh, being, you know, utterly subsistent on, on God, that he introduces concepts like um, Buddhist uh, emptiness and these kinds of things, without explicitly naming them that, but you can see the influence there. Uh, but at the same time, it's not, I mean, it's not strictly Buddhist in that in a lot of this work, he's arguing about God, he's arguing for God, the nature of God. Um, we would tend to see Buddhism as more atheistic. What Nishida is presenting is is kind of a panentheism. He's not theistic in that God is wholly separate from the world. He's not pantheistic uh, in this kind of, uh, you know, God is nature. But it's, it's panentheistic and it's uh, kind of a... a an idea of, of perennial philosophy and of mysticism that the world is in God, the world subsists in God in some sense. Um, but, you know, for Nishida, God, the absolute and, and nothingness are kind of one and the same thing, which isn't at all a negation of God. Uh, but it's it's a question of the, the nature of the absolute and, and what ultimately underlies being and this, again, sort of mystical Eastern idea that non-being is underneath being. But... Uh, if if the conception of non-being is important for Nishida and nothingness, what's just as important is uh, the conception of pure experience. And this is really how he starts this work, and this is how he enters into this discourse. Because this is coming at a time, 1911, this book was published, when Hegelianism is breaking down. Uh, you have philosophy sort of dividing up uh, into more analytic, uh, materialist-type thinkers, you know, the Bertrand Russells of the world, and then more continental thinkers focused on more existential or religiously based questions. You can think of people like Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, Schopenhauer. Uh, and at the same time, there's kind of a third strand of thought, which would be uh, people like Bergson, William James, especially, that are focusing more on, on psychology, focusing more on subjective experience and, and the nature of that and uh, the relation of that to the absolute. And this is where Nishida comes in, because Nishida, his two most important concepts really is, uh, you know, is absolute nothingness and pure experience. And pure experience is important because you know, William James at the time was, was uh, creating this idea of uh, radical empiricism, that the fundamental basis of reality is sort of droplets of experience, uh, that all we can know with certainty is is experience. That's always the way the world is presented. Nishida wants to take it a, a step further than Western philosophers typically have. I mean, if you think of something like Descartes Cogito, you know, I think therefore I am. Uh, that's the basis for Western skepticism um, in modern philosophy. But for Nishida, this doesn't go far enough, and Western philosophy has never gone far enough in skepticism in that. When you say, I think, therefore I am, you know, you're already presupposing an I, you're already presupposing a subject-object distinction. Uh, there's so much presupposed in the Western form of skepticism, and this is the kind of skepticism that generates this division that's so important, the, the outside world and the interior world, consciousness and matter, and then you get idealism and materialism, and you get uh, German idealism trying to uh, find a way out of this. Um, you get Hume leading this into... Uh, total scepticism. Um, but for Nishida, a lot of these problems come in the fact that we always presuppose a subject-object distinction, and he wants to get past this. Uh, and again, this is kind of a, 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 a more Eastern, more mystical way of looking at things, where um, the, the absolute reality of an individual self is, is not presupposed. I mean, uh, you know, in Buddhism, the teaching is anatma, that there is no self. Uh, in Hinduism, you know, Atman is Brahman, that the, the individual self is actually identical to the absolute. Uh, but we have a jiva, you know, we have a, an egoic self that sort of obscures this this fundamental truth. 
Uh, and Nishida's basis is to, you know, he's not arguing this from a religious perspective. He's not saying, well, you know, Buddhism says we have no self, so, you know, Western philosophy is wrong. It, no, he's starting the same way Western philosophy for would start. He's starting with absolute skepticism, but he's saying they don't go far enough. Um, he says, what we have, all that we have, all that we ever have is pure experience. And to divide that into a subject and object distinction and to say, well, okay, I have an experience and there's an outside world, that's too much. All that we really have, all that we have with certainty is pure experience. It's the, just the fundamental reality, the thisness of the sound of a bird singing or the, the colour red. That's always how reality is presented. And Nishida, where his philosophy begins to differ from Western philosophy, is we have this idea that there's a self and it has experience and we experience things and, uh, you know, maybe our consciousness is in our brain and that's how the, the world is presented to us. But there's an outside world, physical world functioning like clockwork and, you know, we're taking it in through sensory perception. Nishida goes beyond that. He says that all that there is with certainty is experience, is consciousness. Subject and object distinction is something that's created in consciousness, created by consciousness. And frankly, we can't conceive of anything outside of pure experience. And this is where Western philosophy is gener uh, generally mistaken, because it takes the outside world to be something that persists without experience. It imagines that the outside world, as we imagine it, exists outside of consciousness. But actually, if you try and imagine the world without consciousness, you're still imagining it in consciousness. Everything is in consciousness for us to conceive of anything, we're conceiving of it in consciousness. So consciousness is always fundamentally ontologically prior. Um, and I was, uh, I'm very partial to this because this is the same argument that I was actually making when I was having the back and forth with JF about materialism and when I was presenting my case of why I think materialism is kind of an incoherent philosophy. Now, I'd never encountered the Kyoto school before and I'm quite, uh, I really enjoyed this book because uh, Nishida has... I think I fundamentally agree with Nishida on, on his entire, on everything presented in this, in terms of his conception of God, the absolute, the self, uh, his rebuttal of materialism. This is as, as close to my own thinking as Anton I've found. So he's presenting the same kind of argument that I made, which is this kind of sceptical approach, which is that matter is just a mental abstraction, but consciousness is always going to be ontologically prior. And so it's a huge leap to imagine that this uh, mental abstraction of matter of an outside world persists outside of experience when everything is given to us in experience. So he does this inversion of Western philosophy where instead of uh, experience being in the self, the self is in experience in some way. Now the self individuals still have experience, but it's a, it's kind of a mediation of pure experience and that pure experience the self itself exists within and is created true. So Nishida wants to carry on with this radical skepticism. He wants to start from what we're certain of and he wants to do away with all of these distinctions, these dualities that are presupposed by a lot of Western thinking. You know, Alfred North Whitehead called it the bifurcation of nature, where we, we start to separate the world into subject, object and, and all of these myriad of distinctions. Uh, Nishida wants to get beyond that and he, he even says that our division of, of sort of objective knowledge and our, our, our separation of knowledge from feeling is mistaken and again this is an idea that you get in certain idealist thinkers like F.H. Bradley in, in, in uh, British philosophy that thinking and feeling aren't separate and that in that, uh, in that fundamental reality of, of pure experience all of these things present themselves as one and so this tendency to abstract world and to present our sort of objective mathematical scientific understanding of the world as the real and sort of lessen the uh the significance lessen the importance lessen the the uh the subjective meaning that is is given to experience lessen those and to say that those are somehow illusory or or uh, don't exist as fundamental reality this too is is mistaken to nishida so what he ends up getting to is this kind of non-dual philosophy where um, the self and the world kind of are one. Now, this isn't, um, there, are, there are issues that could be presented that he hasn't completely fleshed out here, but this is his, his first major work and this is something that he refined over his lifetime. He has an interesting way of writing where he 
sort of does a, a kind of spiral effect where he goes back to a topic again and again and it's one essay after another on the same topic it can get very repetitive but he's constantly refining and trying to simplify and perfect his understanding of it you know it's something very there is something very uh, kind of uh, zen like in the in the repetition and the attempt at perfection it's very different from a, a western approach but so he, he gets to this non-dual philosophy and he does tackle the the question of god and he presents God not not in the in the you know he's not taking a, an atheistic uh, Buddhist approach. He is discussing God in in terms of Christian language, and he he uses quotations from Saint Paul, but he also draws on people like Confucius. And what he ends up with is, I think, he argues for the sort of perennial philosophy understanding of God. You know, this panentheistic absolute, but it's not impersonal. Um, you know, we have this idea that the the absolute, if it's not the, the theistic uh, Abrahamic God, that it would be just an impersonal force that means nothing. But no, for Nishida, it does have meaning. It has subjective meaning. And he actually rebuts a lot of the sort of analytic arguments for God. He's not impressed by cosmological arguments for God or arguing for God on the basis of uh, the existence of objective morality or any of these typical arguments that we're used to in the West. He's not. He's not. Um, he's not into that. He thinks that God is something that's more immediately known. That it's 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 more um, subjectively felt. That there is this desire that we all have for unity, um, expressed through love, and love is the desire for unity. It's the desire to break down the subject-object distinction, and that's why uh, you know love of others is more fulfilling and more good than just merely love of the self. But that the the ultimate fulfillment comes in, uh, with this in 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 unity of of the individual consciousness with the absolute consciousness with God, um, and he actually has a he has quite a a good passage on this that really captures his uh, his Eastern theistic understanding of things. He says, and this is to just make the the point that he's he's moving away from analytic arguments around God here. He says. In the same way that profound mathematics gives no knowledge to those who cannot understand mathematical principles, and that a sublime painting does not move those who have no feel for beauty, the existence of God is considered a fancy or felt to be meaningless and therefore ignored by mediocre and shallow humans. Those who desire to know the true God must discipline themselves and provide themselves with eyes that can know God. To such people the power of God is active in the universe just as a painter's spirit is active in a great painting. God's power is felt as a fact of direct experience. This is the fact of seeing God. Given what I have said so far, God might be felt to be a cold philosophical existence, the base of the unity of the universe, totally unrelated to the activity of our warm feelings, but this is hardly the case. As stated, since our desires arise in the search for a greater unity, we experience joy when we attain to this unity. The so-called self-love of an individual is ultimately nothing more than this demand for unity. Because our infinite spirit is never fundamentally satisfied by the unity constituted by an individual self, it inevitably seeks a larger unity, a great self that envelops both oneself and others. We come to express sympathy towards others and seek congruence and unity between oneself and others. Our love for others is the demand for such a supra-individual unity with them. Accordingly, we feel great peace and utter joy in love for others than in love for ourselves. God, the unity of the universe, is the base of this unifying activity, the foundation of our love, the source of our joy. God is infinite love, infinite joy and peace. So, in, in much of the work, he is providing kind of... Uh, a dialectical argumentative uh, basis for God as absolute as as the underlying undifferentiated unity of pure experience um, but then in parts he moves to this um, uh, you know God as as love the the subjective call towards the absolute uh, God as the fulfillment of that and then this leads to his his own ethical theories and he, he throws out much of, of western ethics he doesn't like this idea that that the good is just what God decides that if, if God wills something bad then it would be good he doesn't like this he doesn't like the idea that people do good for fear of punishment um, that people are motivated by fear of hell because you can't really be acting out of out of goodness if it's if it's out of fear uh, because that's just its own kind of ego egoism 
or if you're just doing something because God commands it again, uh, it's it's certain sort of selfish motives. What he sees as as the ultimate ethical good is is actually the fulfilment of 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 personality, and everyone has a, a unique sort of fulfilment of of their own destiny that they should pursue. And he separates this from egoism. He says individualism and egoism are totally different things. And this is something that's maybe important for today, that egoism and, and the pursuit of sort of selfish individual desires, that it reduces us all to pigs. And there's no individualism in that. You know, uh, individualism is, is, is something more noble. It's, it's, uh, it's struggle. It's, it's discipline. It's trying to, to act out your potential in the world. And again, he sees this kind of a creative endeavor as moving us closer to the absolute and ultimate good conduct, ultimate ethical behavior is when their subjective will is unified with the absolute. When you do things without thought, when there's no ego involved, when it's just um, pure uh, unified activity that is unified with the absolute, that we you know, free will is something that we can sort of attain by uniting our will with the absolute where we engage in spontaneous creative activity. Again, a very Eastern sort of mystical idea that uh, ultimate uh, self-realization or enlightenment is, is the falling away of this uh, egoic self you know, with its, its, its desires and its craving and its attachments. And what's left then is this pure experience, this move away from the self to the pure experience that underlies it. And in that case, our, our actions uh, become kind of spontaneous and harmonious with the, with the absolute. So this fits in with the Western canon. This fits in with German idealism, with Schopenhauer, with Hegel, uh, with Heidegger, with Nietzsche. It fits in with the, the problems presented by these people. But it presents uh, novel Eastern solutions to these things coming out of uh, Eastern wisdom and the Eastern traditions. Uh, that these thinkers uh, did not have access to. And so it's a wonderful synthesis of Eastern and Western thought in that sense. It is difficult, it is obscure in parts. If someone isn't interested uh, in philosophy, very into philosophy, I probably wouldn't recommend this. If someone understands the, the arguments and the, the problems of Western philosophy, this is a, a novel approach that you won't really find elsewhere. So I'll be uh, looking a lot more into the Kyoto School. Thanks again uh, to the person who recommended it. And yeah, I'll be back again with another book review next week. Uh, everyone, please subscribe. Uh, thanks for the ongoing support. And until next week, take care.